Good morning. One of the most beautiful sounds I think you could ever hear is the sound of a baby crying during service. I love it. I'm serious. It's great. Don't take that baby out. Let her cry. Or him cry. I don't know. Was it her? Okay. A her cry. Let her cry. Let him cry. Adults, if you want to cry, we've got to talk about that. But I, uh, I want to apologize to, especially to those of you online. I, I completely messed up this morning, the broadcast. That was completely on me. These guys did wonderful. Winfred is the sound guy. He does wonderful. But I'm kind of like that, that guy who comes in and like throws the curveball for everybody and says, hey, you know, this would be really cool. And, you know, I promise it'll work out. And I don't keep my promise. So it didn't work out. I, we appreciate those of you who are online. Uh, we, we're thankful that you're here. We know we may have lost some people who are online because of all the issues during Bible class. I apologize. Hopefully we've corrected those. Um, and, and again, that, that one's on me, so I apologize. Maybe some of you are here this morning because you saw the class and was like, well, I mean, that's, this is terrible. I'm just going to be there live. Well, welcome. Uh, you know, <laughs> ultimately, that was the goal anyways, right? Um, I'm glad you're here this morning, but I, I do apologize about that. We're trying very hard. They're doing really good, especially with all the new curveballs and technology and different things. And, and we want you to know at home that we love you and appreciate you. You are a part of us, and that's why we're trying so hard to perfect this. But uh, the, on the route to perfection is a process, and so the process can be painful. And actually, I think that's a good, that's a good analogy to kind of kick us off this morning. The process can be painful. It seems like with this technology we're trying to input today, it, it was doing more of controlling us than us controlling it, and we just couldn't quite work that out. Have you ever had that problem before? And uh, when, I was a, when I was a sophomore uh, in, in college, I, had, I, I wrestled. I don't know if you knew that, but I wrestled. Not like WWE stuff, um, but, but like real actual collegiate high school, you know, real wrestling. And uh, I, I wasn't very good, but I tried anyways. And we had this new coach come in who he, he, was, he was a phenom. I mean, this guy was known everywhere. It was, it was a wonder that we had him. Um, he came in, and he, he, was from, he was coming from Russia, having wrestled with all these big-time names and Olympic guys and stuff like that. And he said, look, I'm going to teach you the most simple way uh, to get an advantage in every single match that you're in. And you don't have to know anything about wrestling other than the, the goal is to uh, pin the other guy, which means that he's on the ground and you're on top and he's not moving and you're holding him still, okay? And um, it, we start standing up. And so the, the coach said, the way that you want to get advantage in any match that you are in, it's surefire way, is to take control of their momentum, of their energy. You know, so you're, you're there wrestling, you're going at it, and uh, they push, and if you want to control their momentum, what do you do? You pull, right? And if they, if they pull, then what do you do? You push. Use their energy against them. Use what they were going to take to control you, flip it upside down, and control them. And I thought, man, why has nobody ever taught me this before? They had. I didn't listen. Um, and this is, this, but this is a concept that I think applies to life so well, and, and it really applies to what we're talking about today. If you turn open to Colossians chapter 3, Colossians chapter 3, we'll be there in the first few verses for most of the lesson this morning. When you think about, when you think about, the idea of taking control of what controls you. It's difficult, isn't it? Taking control of what controls you. And I think even in our spiritual lives, in our, our faithful lives, when we decide, like we talked last week, about seeking the mind of Christ, it's not about us. Jesus often, you know, flipped the world upside down uh, by the way that he introduced new commands and so forth. When you talk about taking control of what controls you, 
what you want to do is flip it upside down, use its momentum against itself, and control it. And so not only are we seeking the mind of Christ, but we're seeking the things that are above where Christ is. And that's what Paul says there in Colossians chapter 3. Look at verses 1 through 4. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. Some of those beautiful Beautiful passages there in the letter to the Colossians. Seeking the things that are above. That means for me, I have to begin to change. Because used to be, and I find myself in these situations still, where I'm seeking and focusing on the things that are of this world, of this earth. And when I seem to focus on those things, they begin to take control of me rather than me being able to control them. But change is tough. Change is hard. And I think the secret is not just changing, but exchanging. When I was growing up, some of my favorite weeks of the year uh, the, the week after Christmas and the week after my birthday. You all think that my birthday week and my Christmas week would be the favorite, but that's not the case. Those were great weeks, but only second to the other two, and here's the reason why. Because I got to take all of the clothes that didn't fit and all the toys that didn't work, and I got to take those to the store that next week and exchange them for something that fit and something that works. Ultimately, I, I was looking at it and saying, I want to exchange this for something that I view as better, that can provide me greater joy. And that's exactly what we're doing when we give our lives to Christ. As difficult as change is, the transformation that happens with Christ Jesus, that exchanging of our old self for the new self, is the most beautiful transformation, the most joyous occasion. And that's where Paul says we need to get to. But he understands, just like we do, that the process is tough. We don't much like the process, but I've kind of said this before, we definitely like the product. The process is not easy. You know, there's always growing pains. You've heard that before, the growing pains. You might remember when you were, some of you got to go a little bit further back, but you might remember when you, when you were young, the growing pains, because you're literally stretching yourself to become what you're going to be. And so I think about a, a good application is what we've been going through here at Thomaston Road. Many of you for a lot longer than what I've been going through, uh, but, but the growing pains, you know, I mean, I don't think anybody right now would come up to me and say, boy, Todd, I am so glad to be sitting in these chairs. <laughs> boy, they just, it's nice to be over here in this gym. It, it's, a grow, it's a process. It's a growing pain. And sometimes we have to go through those growing pains. We have to go through that process in order to get to the product. And boy, are you dreaming about the product? Two weeks. Two weeks. And we begin to see what that product will look like. You've already seen some today as the kids. I see kids. You see kids here and there's, there's kids going to Bible class. The process is never easy, but a product is beautiful. And so how do we get to a place where we don't just change, but we exchange? And I think Paul tells us here, 
One of the things that we need to do is, and one of the things that he says in Colossians here, is you need to really reshape, to to re-identify what defines you. You know, our our identity is the most basic, the most true, the the most to-the-core representation of who we think we are. And so, at times in our lives, when we think of ourselves in negative ways, we begin to act and believe in those negative ways. I think I'm imperfect. I, I think I'm not capable. I think I'm not enough. And that typically will be the result of my actions, won't it? And so, our identity can't be found in the things of this world. And Paul acknowledges that. Telling us, don't focus on your identity being a part of this world. We kind of talked about that last week. Because Paul says our identity is now in Christ. You look at verse 3 and he uses four words. Four words that completely reshape our identity. Those first four words in our English Bible. So I'm reading from the ESV. And maybe you have something different in, in, your, in your translation. But in the ESV it says this. And this will, if you want, if we want to reshape our identity, here it is. For you have died. There's not hardly ever a time in our life where we view death as a positive thing. And I'm not advocating that except for in one situation when we die to ourselves then and only then is death a victory then and only then does death give us life for you have died If you've been raised with Christ, and what does Paul mean by that there in verse 1? If you've been raised with Christ, you go back to Colossians chapter 2, verses 11 through 12, and he talks about baptism. You were baptized into Christ. You go through that ceremonial process of being buried in those waters as you are dying to yourself and then being resurrected a new person. Or how about Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33? Now, as you are growing in Christ, seek first the kingdom of God. Or Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, we pursue a deeper knowledge of Jesus Christ. Or Colossians chapter 1, and uh, I believe it's verse 10, and Philippians chapter 1 and verse 27, now live a life that is worthy of the calling of Jesus Christ. This is what it means to be raised with Christ. This is what it means to be transformed, to continually be changed, exchanging your old for the new, seeking what is above, seeking up. Here's what Paul tells us in these verses here. Uh, those of you, there's, there's people here that play video games, right? Any, anybody, I'm looking at some of these kids. Yeah, you just, you set up. All of you kids just set up. I saw that. You, you're play, you play video games. When you play that video game, you, um, you get to a point that's difficult to overcome. And, and what happens? You, uh, you die or, you know, you, you fail or something. And what do you get to do? Start over. You get to start over. And then when you get to that level again, when you get to that point, what do you do at that point? You begin playing a little more cautious. You know what's going to come, what it looks like to fail. And so you learn and you overcome and you grow from it. And then you move on to the next step. There's literally a reset button in video games. And Paul says here, listen, in life, you have one chance. You have an opportunity to have a reset button. Die to your old self. Put on the new and live in Christ. And here's the the great part. If you are walking in the light as He is in the light, 1 John, if you are walking in the light as He is in the light, what happens when you fail? When you mess up? When you sin? It's the grace of God. If you are walking in the light as He is in the light, the blood of Jesus Christ, what does it say? Cleanses you. You know that word cleanses, the type of verb that it is? 
It's an active, ongoing, listen, listen, never-ending word. If you are walking in the light as He is in the light, you are continually being cleansed by the blood of Christ. Amen. That's beautiful. So we literally have this reset button. But then Paul says uh, in verse 3 there, he, he says a couple things. And what Paul does is he, he likes to both address the culture, the culture that's going on and he likes to also point back to the Psalms. And so in verse 1 he says, you know, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. I think about Psalm chapter 110 and verse 1. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Jesus Christ is the victor. When we seek where He is, we are victors with Jesus Christ. And then I think about, Paul says in verse 3 here, uh, set your minds on things that for, for you have died and your life is now hidden with Christ and God. He's doing two things there. First, uh, during these times, the culture would say when somebody would literally die, that they were hidden in the ground, hidden in the earth. And the, there was these teachers in Colossae who were trying to convince them that, hey, if you want to know how to escape that fate of being hidden in the ground, if you want to know the secrets of life and eternity and all of these, I have those secrets. And Paul says, listen, there's no secret other than Jesus Christ. And so when you die to yourself, you don't have to be hidden in the ground, you're hidden in Jesus Christ. Not hidden in the things of this world, but hidden in Him. And he's doing a second thing too. Look over at uh, Psalm chapter 27, the, the verse that we had read earlier. Psalm chapter 27. This is, this is wonderful here. Psalm 27 is this beautiful psalm of David, just like Psalm 110, a psalm of David, that, that shows uh, the protection and provision of God. That same protection and provision that we have in the Son, Jesus Christ. And so and we read verses 1 through 7. Just go back here and look at verse 5. David, in distress from his enemies, is praying to God, and he says this, For he, that's God, will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. Do you notice? It's the same language that Paul uses, hidden in God, which is this view of being protected, having shelter. Um, we get storms here in middle Georgia. Yeah. Uh, uh, you get bad storms sometimes. And when you do, the weather person, this is the only time I advocate trusting a weather person, uh, the weather person says, if you turn the television or radio on, at this point there is danger on the way in these locations. You need to immediately seek shelter. And so you go to a place that is going to provide you the protection that you need in order to go through that disaster, that danger, right? Or, or if a criminal were to break in, God forbid anything were to happen this way, but if a criminal were to break in, you would have a place that you would want to hide, both a place that would protect you and a place that would be out of sight from the danger. And Paul's here saying, listen, Jesus Christ is that provision, that protection. He's the one who gives us that, and our life is now hidden in him. I want you to notice here, Paul says, or uh, David rather says in verse 6 of Psalm 27, now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. You go back to Colossians chapter 3 and verse 4. In your life which is in Jesus Christ, when Jesus appears... You will appear with Him. You will be lifted up with Him in glory. Look at Psalm 26, uh, verse 6, the second half. And I will offer in His tent sacrifices and shouts of joy. You go to Colossians chapter 3. This is, this is David offering these prayers, these shouts of joy. He, he's, he's worshiping God. He's giving Him sacrifice. Colossians chapter 3, verse 17. And whatever you do, word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord. 
It's similar language as Romans chapter 12 and verses 1 and 2, where Paul there says, listen, you need to make sure that you're living a life in this transformed way, that you're living a life that is worthy of the calling of Jesus Christ as a spiritual worship, that your body are living sacrifices. And then here in uh, verse 15 and 16 of Colossians chapter 3, Paul is continually saying, be thankful, be thankful, praise the Lord, pray to God. Just as David responds in this way, Paul says, look where David responds in verse, uh, verse 6, the, the very last one. Um, I will sing and make melody to the Lord. I'll go back to Colossians chapter 3 and verse 16. How do we respond to our new identity in Christ? Sing and make melody in your hearts teaching and admonishing one another. Paul's using the same response that David has as the response that we too should have. And so we, we, we reshape, redefine our identity. And we do this by not just changing, but exchanging. Verse 5 and verse 12 of Colossians chapter 3 both begin with the same word in English. Put. There's an action that needs to take place. If you are seeking the things that are above, where Christ is seated, put this action. The two of them have completely different outcomes, completely different consequences. The first, verse 5, puts, look here, to death. The same act as dying as in verse 3. Put to death all of those worldly things. But then in verse 12, Put on. You see, we, uh, we so often have difficulty with change or even the process of exchanging and the process of transformation because we're trying to introduce the new without getting rid of the old. We're trying to introduce these new characteristics of Jesus Christ and, and just hoping that, hey, if we just you know, introduce a little kindness, maybe it'll get rid of my anger. If I'll just introduce a little bit of love, maybe it'll get rid of my hate. If I'll just you know, introduce a little bit of patience, maybe it'll get rid of my... But you know, when you've become so accustomed to living in this world, and this world is controlling you, believe me, it's not going to let anything come in and try to change you then. You have to flip it upside down and begin controlling what controls you. And the process that we take for exchanging is first getting rid of the old before we introduce the new. Now, don't hear me wrong here. The first step in getting rid of the old is committing your life to Jesus Christ. Believing, repenting, confessing, being baptized. That is the very first step of getting rid of the old. The first step of introducing the new is living faithfully, following the command of the Lord. And there's going to be times that it's not easy, times where we feel hopeless, times where we're overwhelmed, where we feel overcome. And those are the times we hit our knee and we respond as David does. You are my provision. You are my protection. And you and you alone do I trust. I've shared before about my desire to, uh, to lose weight. And uh, every, every physical therapist, every, uh, or not physical therapist, but uh, personal trainer, that's what I was saying, nutritionist, dietitian, whatever, they all say the same thing. You know, uh, if you want to lose weight, the first thing you need to do is, is not the exercise. The first thing is actually the changing your diet. Because the exercise, then you're just trying to, you know, you're, you're doing too much. If you, if you exercise and don't change your diet, there's not going to be any, any progress. And uh, so I went to the doctor and said, well, I changed my diet. Now I have three hamburgers instead of four. <laughs> it's tough. But if I want to lose the weight, I have to first change the old habits, the old behaviors before I can introduce the new ones. And it's the same way in our faith. 
Chris Sly, uh, he was a contestant on one of those uh, singing shows. And uh, he, his first song, it was a hit, and then he disappeared, but it was a wonderful hit. His first song was titled Empty Me. And the chorus goes something like, Empty me of the selfishness inside, every vain ambition and the poison of my pride. Empty me of me, so then I can be filled with you. Verse 9. Seeing that you have put off the old self with its practice, and then have put on the new self. So how do we do this? Well, you might sit there and say, uh, boy, that sounds really good. I I'm ready, I'm fired up, but where do I start? And that's why I love Paul, because he gives us the key for where to start. He tells us right here in these verses where we can start with the most common sense way and the way that, that will probably impact all the rest of our life, the greatest. He tells us where to start if we want to begin to exchange. Look here in verse 8. Rid yourself of obscene talk. Verse 9, do not lie. Verse 13, when you want to complain, forgive. Verse 16, teach and admonish. Verse 17, give thanks. You know what all these things have in relation to each other? They all have to do with our speech. We exchange our speech. You know, they say the, the tongue is the strongest muscle in the body. You know, James warns against those who can curse man and bless God. And we see that at times, maybe we've done that at times in the same sentence. Jesus talks about the importance of confessing His name. You go back to His brother James, he talks about the importance and the value of confessing sin to one another as a part of a healing process. And i got to say, church, we've got to do a better job at allowing others to confess and be vulnerable with us without responding in judgment and condemnation, but instead responding with grace and love. Because you're probably sitting there listening to their vulnerable confession and in the back of your mind saying, boy, I struggle with that same sin. That'd do a better job. We want to exchange our old selves for the new and seek up. Start with the way we talk. There's, there's no, it's no surprise that the words we use are the tools we will use most effectively to confess our faith, share our life with others, and complete the Great Commission, which is to teach the world about the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, we do that. We do all those things with our words. Both those typed out words and the spoken words. It certainly doesn't help when our words are distasteful. People won't respond when we try to make our words a little bit more flavorful. Seek the things that are above where Christ is seated. Seek up. Verse 12, put on as God's chosen ones. Here's the end, guys. If we want to put up the uh, response scene on here, uh, for those who are at home, we want to invite you to respond. You can text us and we'll get that. You can let us know if you want us to keep it private or to make an announcement. For those in the room, the same goes. We, we want you to respond because we're all struggling all the same, trying to be transformed into this image of God, to seek up, to become the person that He wants us to become, to live as God's chosen ones. I, I remember middle school. Do you remember middle school, uh, middle school dodgeball? Anybody play middle school dodgeball? I did. And uh, I remember every single day being terrified because of middle school dodgeball. 
Um, not because I was going to get hit with the ball, um, because I was good, but I've always been a little bit on, on the extra, the larger side. Um, and so I, you know, people were surprised at my level of athleticism because I, I am athletic, uh, but they don't believe it till they see it. It's one of those things. And so I remember being terrified every day because I didn't want to be picked last. You ever had that fear? I didn't want to be picked last. And um, coach would, if we, if you got out there quicker and you were kind of playing around, he he would pick those people to be captains. So I'd always try to try to dress faster, you know, dress out faster and get out there so that I would be picked first. But you know, again, that was a competition in itself. And so I would I would go out and I remember I never got picked last. And people over the first couple of weeks they begin to catch on. They begin to catch on and realize, hey, Todd's kind of athletic here. And it's like, well, I've been trying to tell you. And, uh, and so I, ne- I was never picked last, but one time, several weeks into the school year, one time, one of the happiest days of my middle school life was the day that I was picked first. Can you believe that? It's true. I was picked first. Overall. Not first on one t- First overall. You know? Hey, guess what? When I was picked first, I played better. I performed better. It was just like the energy and the excitement of being picked first that helped me to perform and play better. I I wanted to live up to that expectation. First Peter two nine. We are a chosen people. God has picked you first. For those who haven't given your life to him, he so badly wants to pick you first if you will just let him. We are childs of the one true God. Citizens of the King. We serve a great Lord, a God who is like no other, and there's no other God who can save like our God. We were picked first. Live in that hope. Seek up. Because Jesus is waiting. Will you For those who have not given your life to Christ, give your life today. He wants to pick you first. For those who are struggling and just need an outlet, need prayer, need a hug, or I guess right now we'll, you know, side up, we'll sneak one in while the elders aren't watching or something. We love you and we want you to know that we're here for you. We'll pick you first, too. As together we stand and sing.